Salam alaikum, I'm Carl Arundel and you're watching In Focus. Now, I'm delighted and indeed honoured to be joined by parliamentary veteran, the Right Honourable Sir Gerald Kaufman, MP. Now, Sir Gerald Bernard Kaufman was born on the 21st of June 1930 and he will be 85 this year. He is a British Labour Party politician and a member of Parliament since 1970, first uh, for Manchester Ardwick and then subsequently for Manchester Gorton. He was a government minister during the 1970s and a member of the Shadow Cabinet both in the 80s and 90s. In an address to Parliament just after the beginning of last summer's Israeli assault on Gaza, he explained how, being brought up as an Orthodox Jew and a Zionist, he'd first been to Israel in 1961, he'd travelled innumerable times since, and his family and friends in Israel, he stated that he has known most of the Prime Ministers of Israel, including the founding Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, Golda Meir, he regarded as a close friend, as well as the Deputy, Deputy Igala Yong, who himself was a former general of the 1948 War of Independence, and yet he has described Israel as a rogue state which commits war crimes. Salam alaikum, or should I say shalom, Sir Gerald Kaufman, and welcome to Islam Channel. Thank you. Now, in that parliamentary speech, which I referred to in the introduction, you made the following, uh, that following the wave of killings last summer by Israel soldiers in Gaza, you, you made the point that your parents had come here to Britain as refugees from Poland and that most of your family, uh, their family had been killed in the Holocaust by the Nazis. You said that your grandmother was ill in bed when the Nazis came to her hometown of Stashov and that a German soldier had shot her as she lay there unwell. You said at the time that your grandmother did not die uh, to provide cover for Israeli soldiers murdering Palestinian grandmothers in Gaza and that the present Israeli government ruthlessly and cynically exploits the continuing guilt among Gentiles over the slaughter of Jews in the Holocaust as justification for their murder of Palestinians. The implication, you said, is that Jewish lives are precious but that the lives of Palestinians do not count. You've been described by some as a self-hating Jew. Is their description justified? Yes, all that's true. I was a very strong supporter of Israel <clears throat> uh, right from when it was founded because I'd been brought up to be a Zionist and the inauguration of a Jewish state was a big achievement. It was a big achievement for very, very many Jews and it was certainly a very big achievement for my parents who were political refugees from Poland who came to England. And I was brought up in that atmosphere. I was brought up as a religious Jew go to synagogue every Friday evening and Saturday. I was brought up as a Hebraicized Jew after school every day. I had to go to Hebrew school and being Jewish was my life. And I first went to Israel in 1961. I was motivated to do so by re reading Leon Uris's book Exodus and therefore I did what happened in Exodus namely I went to Cyprus first and then went by boat from Cyprus to Haifa and I went there repeatedly afterwards and along the way I already had family some relatives in Israel but along the way I made very close friends indeed in Israel, in particular one family, a lot of friends, but in particular one family who lived in a kibbutz on the Carmel Mountains near Haifa. And I was a champion of Israel in this House of Commons. Indeed, when Alec Douglas Hume was Foreign Secretary he accused me of being more loyal to Israel than to Britain and caused great commotion in the House of Commons till he apologised. I was asked to write a book about developments in Israel 
and I went all over Israel and what I saw was a developments in which Palestinians both in Israel itself and in the occupied territories, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza, were treated like dirt. And I had not been brought up to believe, brought up, <clears throat> I had not been brought up to believe that Jews should treat anybody else as inferiors. And yet that, that was what the Israelis were doing and are doing, except of course that it's got worse as time has gone, gone on. And it's not simply that they are politically oppressed and physically repressed and suppressed, but in addition to that, their standard of living is far below that of Israeli Jews and they are afflicted by all kinds of restrictions. The roadblocks, hundreds of roadblocks, the wall, which is illegal and stretches out into Palestinian territory, the settlements, which are a violation of all Palestinians' human rights, and the deprivation of rights within the areas in which they live, so that Hebron, which once had an absolutely marvellous market. The market scarcely exists now and where such stalls survive they have to be covered with nets because settlers throw down excretion and stones and other things upon them. And, I, <clears throat> and as a Jew I was brought up to champion human rights and I champion Palestinian human rights. Now, in a speech, uh, the same speech I referred to earlier that you made in Parliament last July, uh, you took exception to a statement made by Israeli Major Leibovitch, who was the spokesperson for the Israeli army, and attempted to explain away the killings at the time of 800 Palestinians. She, she said she had uh, reported that 500 of them were militants, uh, to which you uh, you replied, or you stated that the reply was that of a Nazi uh, and, and that by using the me same measuring sticks, Jews fighting for their lives in the Warsaw Ghetto could also have been dismissed as militants. You have been harshly criticised for making that comparison. Do you, in hindsight, regard it as misguided? I believe that killing Palestinians is a war crime and that includes Palestinians who fight with weapons, as well as innocent civilians, including children and women. There ought not to be military confrontation between Israel and the Palestinians, but although it's not recorded adequately in the overseas press, probably not a single week goes by without the in, uh, Israelis killing Palestinians. They imprison them when they put them to trial, and that includes children, children under 14 who can be held in solitary confinement. They're tried before military courts and not before civil courts. I just think that if Israel did not have the hook of the Holocaust to intimidate the rest of the world, the Israelis will not be allowed to get away with it. The Hol Holocaust was the worst crime against humanity that has been recorded in human history. But Amos Oz, the wonderful Israeli novelist, said in an essay in his book of essays, The Slopes of Lebanon, he, an Israeli Jew, says that the Israelis use the Holocaust as an excuse for doing to others whatever they feel inclined to do. The Holocaust is not an excuse. The Holocaust is an abomination. Now, as you've stated, you regard Israel as a rogue state which commits war crimes. The International Criminal Court prosecutor announced in January this year 
its intention to open an inquiry into possible war crimes carried out by Israel. It was said that this would be a preliminary examination and not an official investigation. Although on the 1st of April, that's in a couple of weeks' time, Palestine is set to be officially recognised on the panel of the ICC and intends to file a complaint on that day against Israel over the killing of innocent civilians during the 2014 war and also in respect of settlement buildings in the West Bank. Do you regard their membership of the ICC as a significant development or a mistake, as many have suggested? I don't think it's a mistake at all. I think it's a very important development. The more the Palestinians achieve recognition within international organisations, the more useful that is. Now, you've pointed out that whilst you regard Hamas as, a, and I quote you, an utterly nasty organisation... As I told them when I met them. Yeah. <laughs> they were, you said, democratically elected. And, to use your phrase, the only game in town. Now, are you saying that there can be no peaceful and just resolution to the current conflict without negotiations and dialogue with Hamas? And what is your position in terms of the continuing air, sea and land embargo, the so-called illegal siege uh, by Israel, to which many regard the international community as also culpable? I don't like Hamas. And when I led a parliamentary delegation to Gaza, consisting of 60 parliamentarians from 13 European countries. And we had a meeting in the parliament building in Gaza, a parliament building which was directly attacked and seriously damaged by the Israelis. I told them that if I lived there, I wouldn't vote for them, just as I assumed they wouldn't vote Labour if they lived in Britain. But Hamas was legally elected. I don't like them, but I don't like the government of this country. This government was less legally elected because it's a coalition. Hamas was elected as a majority. And you can't pretend that they don't exist. I used to work very closely with the former Israeli Foreign Minister Abba Eben. And he said, you make peace by talking to your enemies. And that's what we did in Northern Ireland. We turned en en enemies into non-belligerents. You don't have to make them friends. You don't have to, be, have to be friends with everybody. But you've got to recognize the reality. And you cannot make peace without Hamas. Now, following closures of tunnels and the devastating brutality of the Operation Cast Lead, which led eventually to over 2,000 lives being taken, including hundreds of women and children, the siege continues and seems even worse now than ever it was yes. before. A BBC report just in the last uh, two weeks um, by renowned journalist Luce Dissette, uh six months following this assault last summer, um, described Gaza as resembling Dresden after the brutal assault in World War II. Now, at the Cairo conference in October, donors pledged $5.4 billion in aid, the bulk of which seems to have not been delivered. Senior ministers are at the so-called rebuilding conference in Cairo suggested that there was no longer the appetite to rebuild without having received assurances from Israel that this cycle of violence, and of which there have been, I think, three major... Uh, incursions and assaults in the last six years uh, were, were were confirmed never to happen again. Daniel Taub, just this weekend, the Israeli ambassador to the UK, commented on the that on the weekend that the internal differences, and I'm quoting him, and the absence of cooperation between the PA and Hamas are the reasons behind the delay in reconstructing the Gaza Strip. Do you accept his analysis? What rubbish! They wouldn't assist reconstruction in Gaza if every single factor was favourable. I used to have a good relation with the Israeli embassy in London, but they have nothing to do with me now, and that suits me fine, because I've got total contempt for the organisation. Now, 
What about political will? Have you noted a change in parliamentary support, both here in the UK and in, across in Europe, uh, in the years, um, in terms of the plight of the Palestinians? In December last year, it's a point that the United Nations uh, Security Council rejected a Palestinian resolution demanding an end to Israeli occupation within three years and also a recognition of it as an independent state. Um, Despite this, the parliaments of several European countries, including Britain, France and Spain, have in recent months passed non-binding votes recognising Palestinians' sovereignty. How significant was that? And is there a genuine momentum uh, for pushing for a Palestinian sovereign state now? Every favourable development can be useful. I voted, it was last October, in this House of Commons for the recognition of Palestine as a sovereign state, and the Labour Party f officially voted for that. I would have voted for it whether or not the Labour Party voted for it, but the leader of the Labour Party voted for it. And one must act on the assumption that if Labour wins the election in May, the government will officially recognise Palestine. And there are a lot of us around who make bloody sure that that happens if we're re-elected in May. All progress is better than no progress. It doesn't solve the problem, but it's worth doing. And one of the things is that it makes clearer and clearer to the Israelis that their government is regarded as a pariah government especially under this unspeakable Prime Minister who risked what friendship he has with the Presidency of the United States by going across and addressing this partisan Republican invited uh, session of Congress in which he said among other things that he spoke for all Jews. Well, Carl, he doesn't speak for me. Well, in the wake of the Charlo Hebdo affair, he also suggested that Jews from Europe should make an exodus to Israel. Did you think he had a point? He said that Israel is the home of all Jews. It is not my home. It will never be my home as long as it is ruled by destructive people like the present Israeli government. Now, you've also said that the Israeli foreign minister, Zippy Livni, asserted that her government would have no dealings with Hamas because they are terrorists. And you made the point that it was a rich comment given that her own father, Aton Livni, the chief operations officer of a terrorist group, uh, Gordon Shvi Ruini, I think, organised the blowing up of the King David's Hotel, you said, in Jerusalem, in which 91 victims were killed, including... Including mortals. Jews. Um, are you of the opinion that Israel and its Western allies including Britain, should be in dialogue and negotiation with Hamas? Should there be a greater recognition of the Hamas Fatah unity government? I don't think that Hamas is the issue. I've stated my views on Hamas, democratically elected, an inescapable factor in any settlement. But this goes beyond that, because even if the Israelis refuse to uh, negotiate with Hamas, as they at present do. And, and even though the Palestinians have formed a unity government, including Hamas, the fact is that if only Fatah, once regarded as a gang of terrorists, if only, but now very respectable, if only Fatah were, were the negotiating partner, the fact is the Israelis don't negotiate with them. They're liars, they're cheats, they're war criminals. And if you ask me, I'll say something nasty about them. Say something nasty about them. They're liars, they're <laughs> cheats and they're war criminals. <laughs> OK, now we read this weekend of the news of the Israeli army, army opening fire on boats off the coast of Gaza uh, on, I think it was on Saturday, killing Palestinian fishermen. Six and a half years ago, shortly after Hamas won the Palestinian legislative elections and took charge of Gaza, 
Dov Weissglass, Ariel Sharon's former senior advisor, was revealed to have stated, and I'm quoting him, the idea is to put the Palestinians on a diet, but not to make them die of hunger. Has his vision become reality with the international community conspiring in the starvation of the people of Gaza? They are starving. Many of them are starving. A lot of them only get food via the United Nations. And what a disgusting thing to say. What a disgusting thing to say. After, is, after Jews starved in concentration camps, to say that about allowing other people to eat and putting them on a diet. What a loathsome thing to say. And is, I mean, are those sentiments, I know it was six, six years ago, are they indicative of a, a current prevailing climate in Israel, that the feeling? And I, I heard about some rather shocking uh, sentiments being expressed by senior politicians on social media directly after the assault on Gaza, saying, you know, and some said it's terrible that so many hundred uh, children have been killed, they said it should be 4,000, not 400. I mean, these were senior figures. Is that is that feeling currently uh, uh, prevailing across Israel? I think most Israelis don't care. They're not interested. If you're in Tel Aviv or Haifa, if you're up on the Mount Carmel, plateau where they've got restaurants and hotels, or if you're on the boulevards of Tel Aviv sitting there drinking coffee in the sun, you don't devote a moment's thought to the plight of the Palestinians. It's not a big issue in the current Israeli election. They care about themselves. They are utterly and totally self-centred. It's very, very sad, particularly since it can't go on like this. I'm not saying that something cataclysmic will happen to Israel, but look back. Look back on the uh, apartheid regime in South Africa and the way in which people believed that would go on forever, and suddenly, whoops, it was gone. Look back on the Berlin Wall and the European division between communist and non-communist countries. Nobody ever believed that that would end. But one weekend the Berlin Wall, fall and I, wall fell and I went to Berlin and saw it. And I've got a piece of the Berlin Wall. People said that we could never get a solution to the confrontation between the British government and extremists in Northern Ireland, but recently the Queen went to Ireland to shook hands with a leader of Sinn Féin. Never, never, never believe that things will go on as they are. The Greeks had a saying in Thucydides' history, panta re, everything flows. Just because they're sitting there on their fat backsides outside the cafe, cafes in Tel Aviv doesn't mean that will is guaranteed. And suppressing the Palestinians doesn't guarantee it. Well, Israel faces elections in the next few weeks. Um, there's a, a tendency to shift towards more and more towards extreme right politics. Um, are you optimistic that we can see some of those visions that you hint at realise in the short term, or is this a, a long-term I don't know. Goal? I don't know. We don't know what's going to happen in the Israeli election, though I've got no great hopes. One of the worst legacies of the foundation of Israel that Ben-Gurion tried to correct but couldn't was the proportional representation system, which means that any gang of extremists and louts can play a part in whether an Israeli government is formed. If they had an electoral system of the kind that we have in this country, then you could get a majority government, though that doesn't mean that we would necessarily get a majority government of which some of us would approve. Sir Gerald Kaufman MP, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you today. I want to thank you especially for your time and for joining us on Islam Channel. Thank you. Thank you.